Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and from Space Time with Stuart Gary.com. The show's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, a classical nova awakens from hibernation. A new satellite launched to spy on other satellites and also track the growing problem of space debris. And China launches the first quantum encrypted satellite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have just had their first complete look at an exploding star called a nova. Novae are among both the most frequent and also among the brightest types of stellar explosions known. Unlike supernovae, in which a star is destroyed in a cataclysmic blast ending its life, novae are powerful near-fatal explosions on the surface of a white dwarf star, which can reoccur repeatedly without destroying the star. Astronomers have known about novae for years, but this new study, reported in the journal Nature and on the pre-press physics website archive.org, is the first to actually study the build-up to a nova event, and also the star's post-nova phase, in the process finding the first direct evidence supporting the nova hibernation hypothesis, which predicts that novae evolve through phases of both high and low mass transfer. Novae occur in binary star systems in which the two stars are in an extremely close orbit around each other. One of the stars in the system has to be a white dwarf, the stellar corpse of a sun-like star. Having run out of the nuclear fuel it needs to shine, the star firstly expands into a red giant, then puffs off its outer layers, leaving behind its white-hot stellar core known as a white dwarf, a super-dense object about the size of the Earth, which will slowly cool over the eons of time. In a tight stellar binary system, the powerful gravitational pull of the super-dense white dwarf will draw matter off the gaseous envelope of the companion star. Once enough matter is drawn off the companion star onto the white dwarf surface, the pressure builds up to a point where a runaway thermonuclear eruption will take place, igniting the surface material and producing a powerful explosion called a nova, which increases the white dwarf's brightness by a thousand times. Because the white dwarf's not destroyed by the eruption, these nova events can reoccur on timescales of thousands to millions of years. Astronomers from the University of Warsaw were studying a white dwarf star called V1213Sen when it went nova in 2009. The team, which had been monitoring the same star since 2003, were able to carefully document changes in the white dwarf's evolution in the years leading up to and following the nova explosion, the first time this had been done. The authors detected a series of small outbursts, known as dwarf novae, leading up to the classical nova explosion. However, rather than exploding on the surface of a white dwarf, as in the case of a classical nova, these dwarf novae occurred in the accretion disk of material around the white dwarf, which had been drawn off the companion star. The researchers associated this with a low rate of material transfer onto the white dwarf surface in the lead-up to the nova eruption. After the nova blast, the white dwarf was some two orders of magnitude brighter than before the blast, and there was no trace of dwarf nova behaviour, implying that the mass transfer rate had increased significantly as a direct result of the nova explosion. As well as helping astronomers predict when a nova might erupt, the fluctuating mass transfer rates also support the nova hibernation hypothesis, which predicts high mass transfer rates for centuries immediately after a nova event, followed by a steady decrease over the following hundreds to millions of years as the star enters a hibernation phase. The nova hibernation hypothesis first gained support following the discovery of ancient nova shells around several dwarf novae. But direct evidence for considerable mass transfer changes prior, during and after nova eruptions hadn't previously been found. NASA's Cassini spacecraft has found deep-sided canyons on Saturn's moon Titan that are flooded with liquid hydrocarbons. 
The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, represents the first direct evidence for the presence of liquid-filled channels on Titan, as well as the first observational evidence of canyons on Titan hundreds of metres deep. The findings are based on a Cassini flyby over the Saturnian moon. Cassini's radar instrument was used to focus on the channels as they branch out from a large northern Titan sea called Ligia Mare. The observations revealed that the channels are in fact narrow canyons. In particular, a network of them named Vlid Flumia are up to 570 metres deep and just under a kilometre wide, with slopes often steeper than 40 degrees. The branching channels appear dark in the radar images, much like Titan's methane-rich seas. Previously, it wasn't clear if the dark material was liquid or merely saturated sediment, which, at Titan's frigid temperatures, would be made of ice, not rock. The new data confirms that the canyons are probably filled with liquid. Cassini's radar has often been used as an imager, providing a window to peer through the dense haze that surrounds Titan to reveal the surface below. But during this pass, the radar was used as an altimeter, sending pings of radio waves to the moon's surface to measure the height of features there. Scientists then combined the altimetry data with previous radar images of the region in order to make their discovery. Key to understanding the nature of the channels was the way Cassini's radar signal reflected off the bottoms of the features. The radar instrument observed a glint, indicating an extremely smooth surface, similar to the ones observed from Titan's hydrocarbon seas. The timing of the radar echoes as they bounced off the canyon's edges and floors provided a direct measure of their depths. The presence of such deep cuts in the landscape indicates that whatever process created them was active for a long period of time. Either that, or it was eroded down much faster than other areas on Titan's surface. The researchers' proposed scenarios include both an uplift of the terrain, or alternatively changes in sea level, or even perhaps both. Earth is warm and rocky with rivers of water. On the other hand, Titan's cold and icy with rivers of methane. And yet scientists have been able to find similar features on both worlds. While the altimeter data also showed that the liquid in some of the canyons around Ligia Mare is at sea level, the same altitude as the liquid in the sea itself, in other canyons it sits tens of metres higher in elevation. Scientists are interpreting the latter as being tributaries which are draining to the main channels below. Future work will extend the methods used in this study to all the other channels Cassini's radar altimeter has observed on Titan. The researchers expect their continued work to produce a more comprehensive understanding of the forces which have been shaping the Saturnian moon's landscape. A new study has discovered that mineral veins found in Gaul Crater were formed by the evaporation of ancient Martian lakes. The discovery, reported in the journal Meteoritics and Planetary Science, is based on a study of the mineralogy of the veins that were paths for groundwater in mudstones found at Yellowknife Bay in Gaul Crater by NASA's Mars Curiosity rover. The study suggested the veins formed as the sediments from the ancient lake were buried, heated to about 50 degrees Celsius, and eventually corroded. One of the study's authors, Professor John Bridges from the University of Leicestershire, says the taste of the Martian groundwater would be rather unpleasant, with about 20 times the content of sulphate and sodium compared to bottled mineral water on Earth. However, the thing is there are some microbes here on Earth which love sulphur and iron-rich fluids because they can use these elements to make energy. Therefore, from an astrobiology point of view, for the question of habitability in Gull Crater, the taste of the water was very exciting news. The researchers suggest that the evaporation of ancient lakes in the Yellowknife Bay region would have led to the formation of silica and sulphate-rich deposits. Subsequent dissolution by groundwater of these deposits, which the authors predict are present in the Gale Crater sedimentary succession, led to the formation of pure sulphate veins within the Yellowknife Bay mudstone. The study predicts the original precipitate was most likely gypsum, which dehydrated during the lake's burial. The authors compared the Gale Crater waters with fluids modelled for Martian meteorites, shergatites, nacolites, and also the ancient meteorite ALH84001, as well as rocks analysed by Mars rovers, and with both ground and surface waters found on Earth. The aqueous solution present during sediment alteration associated with the mineral vein formation at Gale Crater was found to be high in sodium, high in potassium, and high in silicon but it had low magnesium, low iron and low aluminium concentrations, and it had a nearly neutral to alkali pH level. The results provide further evidence for the long and varied history of water in Gale Crater. 
It appears multiple generations of fluids, each with a unique chemistry, must have been present in order to account for what's found in the Martian rock record today. As for the meteorite ALH 84001, well, I think it's about time we rehash what scientists really know about this colourful piece of Martian history. More on that in a future episode of Space Time. The spaceflight community is abuzz right now with rumours that SpaceX boss Elon Musk is about to announce the company's long-term plans for the exploration of the red planet Mars at next month's International Astronautical Congress in Mexico. SpaceX has already announced details of its Red Dragon project to send a modified Dragon V2 capsule to land on Mars in 2018. The company's already in negotiations with NASA about both potential landing sites and also the sorts of scientific instrumentation likely to be installed aboard the spacecraft. That instrumentation is likely to include a number of NASA projects. Red Dragon will launch on SpaceX's new rocket, the Falcon Heavy, basically three Falcon 9 core stages mounted side by side. The Red Dragon will be based on SpaceX's Dragon V2 capsule, which is designed to transport up to seven crew members to and from the International Space Station with the first manned test flight slated for next year. The existing Dragon capsule, which is used for cargo runs, is already equipped with an ablative heat shield for atmospheric re-entry, making it the only supply ship capable of bringing equipment back to Earth from the orbiting outpost. The new Dragon V2 capsule adds four side-mounted thruster pods to the configuration. Each of these pods is fitted with two 16,000-pound thrust Super Draco 3D printed rocket engines. The eight rocket motors will allow for vertical takeoff and landing, providing both a launch abort and escape system during liftoff and for propulsive landings, thereby relegating parachutes to the role of emergency backups, and at the same time allowing the capsule to land anywhere with the accuracy of a helicopter. The Dragon V2 also contains life support systems, much larger windows to give the crews a view, landing legs which extend from the bottom of the spacecraft just before touchdown, new flight computers and avionics with tablet controls, an autonomous docking system to replace the manual docking system used on the existing Dragon cargo ship, and redesigned high-capacity solar arrays. SpaceX's new rocket, the Falcon Heavy, will fly off one of two former Space Shuttle launch pads, 39A, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Its maiden flight is slated for December the 16th this year. Rather than carrying crew, the Red Dragon will be configured to transport between two and four tons of scientific equipment, providing NASA with new data on Mars landings in preparation for the agency's future manned missions to the Red Planet, slated for the 2030s. Mind you, there have been rumours coming out of Glendale, California, that SpaceX could be looking at conducting its own manned mission to Mars, possibly as early as 2024. Now there's speculation that Musk will use the Astronautical Congress to announce details of his futuristic new spacecraft called the Mars Colonial Transporter, or MCT. From what we've been told, the MCT is a large interplanetary spacecraft capable of carrying up to 100 passengers and cargo. It's understood SpaceX is planning a maiden flight for the MCT in 2022, followed by the first MCT Mars flight with passengers, possibly as early as 2024. Because of its massive size, the MCT would need a new launch vehicle, informally known as the BFR. It would be powered by SpaceX's new Raptor liquid methane and liquid oxygen fueled reusable rocket engines rather than the RP-1 kerosene and liquid oxygen powered Merlin engines used on the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launch vehicles. So, I guess for the moment at least, it's a case of watch this space. A Delta IV rocket is successfully blasted into orbit, carrying two United States Air Force Space Command spy satellites designed to study other satellites and track space debris. The United Launch Alliance flight lifted off into black early morning skies over the Atlantic Ocean from Space Launch Complex 37B at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. Launch enabled. GE main power off. Off. Upper stage LH2 secure at flight level. T minus 30 seconds. Status check. Go Delta. Go Aspen. A6, green board. 25. Flight lock in. SRM, TVC, blowdown. T minus 15. Rofi ignition. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And lift 
liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the Af Space 6 mission for the United States Air Force. The chamber pressure on the main engine. The chamber pressure on both solid rocket motors. 17 seconds into the flight. Good engine control in the first stage. 25 seconds in. You are hearing the voice of Steve Agate providing launch vehicle Chipper ascent data. Chipper pressure beginning to trail off with the solid rocket motors as expected as we're passing 33 seconds. Altitude passing of 2.2 nautical miles. 44 seconds, Mach 1. Vehicle now going transonic. 57 seconds, Max Q, maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Passing the one minute mark. Altitude now 7.3 nautical miles. Velocity 2713 feet per second. Downrange distance 4.5 nautical miles. About 20 seconds now remaining until the solid rocket motors burn out. Still looking good at 1 minute 20 seconds. Standing by for SRB burnout. Burnout. Standing by for separation. And separation. With separation of the solid rocket boosters, 1 minute 48 seconds in. The uh, Delta IV rocket only weighs now one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at the rate of 1,947 pounds per second. Altitude now 29.4 nautical miles, velocity 6,000 feet per second. Downrange distance 29.2 nautical miles. A little bit over Mach 5 now, five times the speed of sound. Second stage uh, systems online now. We've uh, opened up the hydrazine uh, supply valve. Mission events occurring very close to their anticipated time, passing 2 minutes 38 seconds. At this time, we're coming up on the maximum fairing temperature. This time of the flight, that's passing 2 minutes 49 seconds. Altitude now passing 48.3 nautical miles. Velocity 9,687 feet per second. Downrange distance 77.6 nautical miles. Just passing through Mach 10, going 10 times the speed of sound. Less than one minute remains on our first stage flight. Altitude now passing 61 nautical miles, velocity 13,900 feet per second, downrange distance 138 nautical miles, passing through Mach 15, 15 times the speed of sound. The two geosynchronous space situational awareness program, or GSSAP, satellites separated from their Delta IV medium launch vehicles upper stage about six hours after liftoff, moving into their near geostationary orbit. The satellites are designed to track, monitor and examine other spacecraft in the geosynchronous orbital belt. The spacecraft have been specifically designed to perform rendezvous and proximity operations, allowing them to maneuver close to other spacecraft while still maintaining a safe distance. The new satellites will join two earlier GSSAP spacecraft launched back in 2014. As well as checking out other spacecraft, the GSSAP satellites will also track space debris, providing the Air Force with the ability to reduce potential orbital collisions through the early detection of potential hazardous objects. The United States Air Force Space Command is currently tracking over 23,000 pieces of orbital space debris. China has launched the world's first quantum-encrypted satellite aboard a Long March 2D rocket from the Xiaquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Gobi Desert. The 500-kilogram quantum science telecommunications satellite, nicknamed Motsi after an ancient Chinese philosopher and scientist, is designed to test quantum entanglement from a 600-kilometer high sun-synchronous orbit, sending messages using quantum keys between ground stations in China and Europe. The two-year mission is part of a joint research project between the China Academy of Sciences and the University of Vienna to test quantum communications over far greater distances than ever attempted on the ground. The experiment will use an instrument aboard the satellite to generate a pair of quantum-entangled photons. A high-powered telescope on the spacecraft will then beam one half of the pair to a ground station in China and the other half to a ground station in Austria. The photons will be in a quantum state, meaning the properties of one photon will directly depend on the properties of the other. Scientists will use the photons to create a secret cryptographic key, allowing messages to be exchanged between Europe and China through conventional networks like the Internet, with the key needed to break the encrypted code. The project's designed to help set up an encrypted quantum communications network using a high-precision acquisition, tracking and pointing system between the spacecraft and ground stations. The satellite's equipped with a quantum key communicator, quantum entanglement emitter, entanglement source, laser communicator and processing unit. The quantum entanglement ground source is designed to provide ground to satellite teleportation experiments based on photon entanglement.
been a busy time for the Chinese as well as their quantum satellite. A Chinese Long March 4C rocket has blasted into orbit, carrying the new Gofen 3 surveillance satellite from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern Jiangxi province. The flight comes amid growing tensions over Beijing's annexation of parts of the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. The archipelago, which lies off the coasts of the Philippines, Malaysia and South Vietnam, offers rich fishing grounds and contains significant oil and natural gas reserves. China's raised tensions by installing extensive military bases and artificial structures on several reefs in the vicinity of the Philippines and Vietnamese-occupied islands. The new spacecraft is China's first low-orbit spy satellite, capable of real-time imaging in all weather conditions and at resolutions down to under a metre. The new satellite's the latest member of the Communist Party's growing global surveillance network, which already includes a constellation of spy satellites, as well as a fleet of aircraft and stratospheric airships, all designed to monitor Beijing's growing strategic interests. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Just search for Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This show is also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. This month exploring the mystery of fast radio bursts. <laughs>